Uh, biomimicry, it literally means copying nature. It seems to be at real odds to much of what, what our culture stands for. We overcome nature, we defy it, we bend it to our will. We build dams, highways, skyscrapers in an attempt to reduce nature to a bit player in our lives. And this has brought us to the brink of the abyss. We're so close we can peer over the edge. Nature now looks to take its revenge, to truly demonstrate who is master. What can we do to pull back? To prevent us from hurtling over the edge? Perhaps we'll hear just the barest suggestion of an idea tonight between our two speakers. Perhaps by listening to nature, using its principles, we can create a more sustainable uh, connections between human communities and the world that envelops us. So it's my intense pleasure to introduce tonight's two speakers. We'll hear first from Nicole Isle, who's the Senior Sustainability Advisor with Brightworks and leads the firm's campus and urban planning work. Drawing on her experience in watershed ecology and environmental planning, Natalie helps project teams realize a more comprehensive level of sustainability by combining economic, ecological, and systems inter uh, integrated with team creativity, innovation, and collaboration. Um, our next speaker will be Amanda Sturgeon, who's the certification director for the Living Building Challenge. She's a licensed architect and has been influential in the sustainable building movement in Seattle for the last 13 years. Prior to joining the Living Building Challenge, she was a senior associate at Perkins Will, where she co-directed the Sustainable Design Initiative across 20 offices worldwide and managed numerous sustainable projects. Um, in 2011, she's a, a fellow uh, of the AI, uh, AIA and AIUSI. I think I got all those vowels in there. Uh, but she, she just got through, she spent a month in Italy studying biophilia and beauty as a pathway to a restorative future. So I think both these speakers will have a, an excellent view of biomimicry, biophilia, and how it connects between design and uh, human social uh, networks. So we'll start with Nicole, and please give her a hand. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you tonight. It's a pleasure being here to talk to you about biomimicry. I should also say that I'm a uh, trained biologist at the design table, and I studied with Janine Benyus and Dana Baumeister of the Biomimicry Institute. Um, my background is in watershed ecology. I'm a, I'm a biologist, and I spent a number of years um, working in the uh, scientific field, doing a lot of field studies. And so it's been a thrill to take what I know about the biological world and combine it with the work that I do now with architects, engineers, and, and um, the construction industry. So tonight I'm going to talk about the art and science of biomimicry. And biomimicry is capturing the world's attention. It is just gl uh, gaining global recognition. The London Financial Times calls it a growth area for this industry. Harvard Business Review in 2009 called it one of uh, the business world's top 20 ideas. In fact, Janine Benyus, the founder of, uh, of uh, the Biomimicry Guild and Institute and coined the term biomimicry, has been deemed one of the world's most influential designers by Business Week. In fact, the Biomimicry Guild has a close partnership with HOK, one of the largest architecture firms in the world. She's won uh, numerous other awards along with Biomimicry Guild and Institute. She won the Earth Environment Award through the United Nations Environment Program, um, has been on the cover of uh, Time Magazine, and is working with Ash Ashoka Changemakers, um, one of the world's leading organizations of um, social entrepreneurs. It's a global network, and they're taking on some of the biggest challenges in what it takes to design living buildings. You know, what are the big sort of issues that we face in terms of um, en renewable energy production efficiency levels, or the fact that concrete has so, such a high level of embodied energy, um, and it's one of the most prevalent construction materials used. These are big challenges that we need to deal with, and so she is helping with the Shoshoka change makers to take on these sort of challenges. So what is biomimicry? Biomimicry is the conscious emulation of life's genius. What does that mean? It means that 
It's a, it's a learning tool, it's a design discipline, it's a way of thinking about the world. It's based on learning from nature and applying what you learn to human challenges. It's not a slavish recreation, it's not post-rationalization of design, calling a spiral staircase um, sort of looking like the spiral of a seashell, for example. It's intentful design where you're thinking about nature, you're learning from it, you're applying what you learn with intent, with recognition to the challenges that you face, whether it's manufacturing or design or um, whether it's um, in uh, organizational development in many different industries. Biomimicry is this great, incredible intersection between um, innovation and sustainability. And really, nature is our bench best benchmark for sustainability, right? And so if you use nature as a tool in understanding how to build greener buildings and how to organize um, businesses in ways where they're more efficient, more fluid in their operations, we can look to nature because nature has solved a lot of those different challenges. And in doing that and using it as a, as a learning tool and a discipline, you open vast levels of innovation in how you think about the world, how you think about the business that you're in. And really, this is an imperative that we all face because we're limited in the resources that we have available to us. This is an incredible graphic that shows on your left, and the blue ball represents all the water on the planet compared to the sheer volume of it. On, the, on, your, uh, on your right, the pink ball is all the atmosphere. So all the water, fresh water, salt water in the glaciers, in the atmosphere, captured in that little ball, and in the atmosphere on the, on the right with that pink. So it just shows there are limits and boundaries to the resources that we have, and that we need to be efficient with the way that we use them, and we can look to nature to learn how to go about living within balance on this planet. Nature has a lot to teach us. Because after all, life has been around for a very long time, and human existence is one little blip on that, on that timeline. In fact, over the 3.85 billion years of trial and error that nature has, has undergone in research and development, um, there has been a 99.9% .9 failure rate. And the 0.1% of species that you see today, the 30 million different species, were one of them, have figured out the materials, forms, processes, systems, and strategies needed to sustain themselves in conditions of the earth today. And these are the same conditions that we must face. And so it makes sense to look to nature to understand, okay, how can we live, how can we solve design challenges, for example, in ways that are sustainable, in ways that um, are moving beyond sustainability into regenerative means where we're healing the planet. Nature's figured that out. And we can use nature as a learning tool to solve those challenges. So let's go through a couple case examples. Now, biomimicry really got its start in the late 1990s with Janine Benyus's book, um, Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. And uh, the roots of biomimicry are in product design, but it's expanded into all different professional sectors. So let's go through a couple case studies in product design. Whale power, this is an amazing concept. Dr. Frankie Fish, was interested in how humpback whales are so agile in the water, these massive creatures. Well, what he realized is the leading edge of their fins have these bumps called tubercles. And so he coined this term called tubercle effect. And basically, these tubercles allow for this massive mammal to move through the water and be incredibly agile. And he took that design in nature and he copied it in rotors, in, in, in any type of machine that moves any type of medium, whether it's air, water, steam, oil, and what he found was that there's 32% less drag and 8% increased lift. And in the case of wind turbines, a 20% production increase. So all of a sudden, you have this design that has been in nature for so long, and it was uncovered, brought to our industry in ways that we're making green power is more sustainable on this planet, and all of a sudden you've got 
a um, alternative energy means that's been struggling to find its place in the market competitive with fossil fuel alternatives. This is a great achievement. Um, these wind turbines are being tested on um, Prince Edward Island and, uh, and we'll see them in production soon in the market. Columbia Forest Products, soy glue. Dr. Kai Chang Lee out of Oregon State University was walking down the beach one day and he was very curious about why mussels, the blue mussel in fact, was able to stick to rocks so well. And Dr. Kai Chang Lee being in the wood uh, forest products research uh, lab at Oregon State, he was looking at you know, different composite wood. So he was dealing with a lot of formaldehyde type products. And he thought, well, if Mussels can do this so well. How can I copy that in wood forest products? You know, what is it that allows them to stick so well in, in, in environments that are so prone to harsh um, element pressures, the constant, um, uh, constant bashing of waves and, and the elements? And so he took the mussels back to the lab. He dissected the protein structure, and he mimicked that protein structure in a soy base. And what he came up with was a glue that um, actually outperformed urea formaldehyde, was more water resistant because it's the protein structure that's used to environments that are more aqueous. And so all of a sudden you have a, a glue where urea formaldehyde, a carcinogen-based glue, has been struggling with in the market for so long. Nature had the answer, a glue that's non-toxic and outperforms formaldehyde. Calera. This is uh, an idea that's out of Los Gatos in California. Um, this company recently won a $20 million grant from Department of Energy. And what they're doing here is they're making green concrete. And they're doing this by actually sequestering carbon dioxide, mimicking a process that's similar to how um, uh, coral reefs form. And so what they're doing is they're taking seawater, they're injecting carbon dioxide into it, and that um, starts the process of forming calcium carbonate. And with calcium carbonate, that is the base substance of um, coral reefs. And so they're making this, this uh, concrete compound. Now what's so amazing here is that all of a sudden you have a concrete, $170 billion concrete industry in the US that is the third or, or fourth largest anthropogenic um, carbon dioxide emitter and all of a sudden you're taking an industry that's such a big polluter and you're turning it to carbon negative. So for every ton of concrete that's created through this process, they're sequestering a half ton. So the World Coal Institute suggests that this product could sequest 70 years of emissions. Um, so this is a very exciting new discovery that has actually been in uh, research for a while and we hope to see it on the open market soon. Uh, a third, uh, third example or fourth example I want to show you is moving from the product industry to the built environment. This is the, the um, two, 200, 300, 60,000 square foot uh, Eastgate Center in Harare, Zimbabwe. And what's interesting about the Eastgate Center is that it is um, mimicked after the way that termite mounds uh, ventilate their ter ventilate, th ventilate their mounds. And the way that they do that is through a series of chambers on the outside of the mound. And they're a, they're a distance from the mound and they spend all day opening and closing these chambers because at the center of the mound is a fungus that the termites feed on. And that fungus must stay at exactly 87 degrees throughout the day and night when you have temperature fluctuations outside from 35 degrees up to 104 degrees. Um, and so this is like a perfect example, if you're an engineer, of designing in nature to like ASHRAE 55, the equivalent of ASHRAE 55, which is our national uh, thermal comfort standard. And so these termites spend all day opening and closing these chambers to maintain that 87 degree temperature. So that was the um, design that was mimicked in the Eastgate Center. And the Eastgate Center uses no um, mechanical cooling. They have some fans to help exhaust the air. But um, right away, the engineer, the owner of the building, saved three and a half million dollars in infrastructure costs and rents in this building are 20 percent below uh, buildings in the surrounding area because of those avoided costs. So 
what can we, how can we apply biomimicry in our own lives? Well, it's tough to imagine when you live in such a dense urban environment. But really, if you ease your senses, if you put aside your cleverness in your professional field, if you open your eyes up to what nature can teach you all around you, you'll find some amazing discoveries. Because down on the ground, nature is all around you, from the street trees to your backyard trees, to the farmer's market, to wildlife, to recreation, the beautiful parks in the Seattle area. There is opportunity to find new discovery in nature. And that's really what a lot of biomimicry is about, is opening up your awareness and learning about these new, new forms of discovery. So this is my family dog, Willie. And this is Willie on a really good day. And the reason that I want to show a picture of Willie is that you can make amazing discoveries in just the very um, sim simple um, joys of life. And that's exactly what happened with a Swiss engineer, George de Maestra, when he discovered Velcro. So he came home from a hunting trip one day, and he was looking at the burrs, inspecting the burrs on his dog's fur, and he noticed the hooks on the burrs. And this was in the early 1940s. And so that's when Velcro was discovered by just the sheer curiosity of an individual that had sort of calmed his cleverness and opened up his curiosity to the natural wonders of the world. Now, Velcro started cotton-based, took a wrong turn, and, and hit uh, nylon and synthetic compounds, so not a true sort of um, biomimetic discovery. You know, there's ways to turn it back around, but I think in the basis, just thinking about nature and what we can learn, this is a really good example. An example that you can find, you know, in your own backyard. So let's look at other examples that you might find in your own backyard and applying it to our lifestyles here at home in a denser urban environment. Love to get out of town, can't always do that. Um, so what can we find in our own backyard? This is a honeycomb. And um, nature does amazing things in that it always follows the path of least resistance and uses as little energy as it possibly can. And so in this pattern, and that's one way you can utilize biomimicry, is in mimicking form, pattern, is that in this honeycomb shape, the hexagon angle of 120 degrees is actually stronger than a 90 degree angle. And also in a repeated pattern like this, you're using less material, right? Because you're sharing sides in the, in the overall shape. And then also, you've got a round shape with, which maximizes volume to surface area, thus using less material in the overall form. So why is nature going to spend any more energy than it possibly needs to in forming a substance? And it's perfectly forming that substance to the function in which it needs to provide. And so this is an excellent example of mimicking pattern in nature, something that you can find at a city park and maybe not get too close to, but um, nonetheless, an exciting discovery. So another way you can look at biomimicry is in mimicking process. So in looking at um, processes within organisms, across organisms, or in the physical environment. We've learned a lot in, in uh, solar, the solar industry and uh, PV panels and understanding how to collect energy, how to create energy from the sun's rays. And so we've learned a lot about that, and I think it's important when you're walking down the street, inspecting you know, the street trees or enjoying your backyard, thinking about all the ways that nature has perfected collecting solar energy. And that can be in thinking about how nature arranges leaves on a tree to optimize the amount of um, solar collection area to create that energy. How to use chlorophyll as a medium instead of you know, heavy silica-based um, monocrystalline sort of compounds that you find in common uh, photovoltaic panels. There's a company in Australia called Dysol that's actually making a photovoltaic panel based on chlorophyll as a medium, not chlorophyll itself, but a dye 
that mimics chlorophyll, a dye that you can get in a range of different colors. And this dye is a lot easier to manufacture, doesn't take as much water, heavy manufacturing process like silica does. And um, it can easily be injected into a glass plate that can be flexible. And so it becomes building integrated. You can use it as a facade. Um, and it doesn't have to be a panel that's a separate structure on top of the building. So these are amazing discoveries that we found just from inspecting trees and learning from them and inspecting plants too, other plants. Like this um, ranunculus here, this is a common buttercup. And from the buttercup and other plant species, we've learned about heliotropic leaves and flowers, how, how flower heads will tend to follow the sun throughout the course of the day. Some plants do it, some plants don't, not all. Um, but the common buttercup does. And so what do we see now? Solar tracking technology that tracks the sun. It's a dish throughout the day that collects energy, optimizes it by facing the dish in the direction of the sun as it travels across the sky. We learn that from, from different plants. Also in leaf flexibility and maximizing solar rays and how the, the light hits the leaves throughout the course of the day. They're flexible to maximize the, um, the leaf area and capture the sun's rays at the correct angle. So lots of things that we've learned from trees and other plants. Here's a third example that you might find um, in your discovery when thinking about biomimetic solutions. And this is more of a metaphorical example, but I think this is a really interesting one. Forest stand dynamics. Uh, in forests, you have gaps in the uh, canopy where there may have been a natural disaster. There may have been um, like a forest fire or a flood, for example. There may have been disease. Um, all kinds of different pressures on the forest stand. They create these gaps. Well, these gaps are, don't represent destruction. They represent opportunity. And the gaps are, can be um, organized in terms of size and shape, um, abundance, composition, spatial, temporal distribution. And I think the parallel here that I think is very interesting is in urban planning and redevelopment. When we think about downtown urban areas like Seattle and um, the redevelopment of uh, the aqueduct, Sorry, the aqueduct, the viaduct, and areas of blight here. I was like, you know, reminiscing about my travels to Italy. And, um, in thinking about new opportunity in areas of redevelopment, if you characterize them in terms of size and shape, abundance, these different forest dynamics, and saw them as open gaps of opportunity, and at open gaps, what happens in forests is that the surrounding needs of the forest can be met in that, in that gap. Because there are all, there's always change, there's always pressures on the forest, either to bring new diversity in, to add more nutrients to the soil, whatever it may be. And so this new opportunity allows for some wonderful things to happen to build the integrity, the resiliency of that forest stand. And so, too, we can take those parallels to build the resiliency and the integrity of our urban areas. So some resources for you to take home. Who's been to the AskNature.org website? OK, several of you have. So um, as budding biomedics, and maybe some of you have applied biomimicry to your projects or to your um, design processes, whatever, or maybe in teaching others. This is a wonderful tool to take home, and it's free. You can get right on, and you can learn about nature right at the fingertips of your computer. You go to asknature.org. There's a search engine in the upper right-hand corner. You can put in any challenge you face. Um, glare control, thermal regulation, collecting water, um, heat loss, heat gain, whatever it may be. You can put in a common uh, animal's name. You can put in elephant, flamingo, whatever it may be. You don't have to be a biologist. You don't have to put in scientific names. And what this search engine does is that it's linked up to E.O. Wilson's Encyclopedia of Life. E.O. Wilson, the famed entomologist, Harvard professor, naturalist, he's trying to catalog, uh, categorize catalog the different species on the planet. 
He's got an incredible undertaking. But all the great work that he's done links right up to Ask Nature. Ask Nature does a query for what you put into that search engine, and you'll get a list of species and the ways that they solve for that very same challenge in all different environments. So these are things that you can apply to your profession as an architect, an engineer, as a research scientist, as a teacher, as a business leader, whatever it may be. Nature follows two simple main uh, rules to live within the operating conditions of the planet. Those are to adapt and evolve and to create conditions conducive to life. And um, a colleague of mine, Darcy Winslow, has an interesting perspective on sustainability. She says that sustainability is not a challenge, it is a condition to be created. And that puts a very positive spin and puts a lot of hope as to the opportunity that we have in um, how we choose to move forward in um, our impacts on this planet. And I think that biomimicry is one way to go about that. The closer that we're able to align ourselves with nature and reawaken our connections with it, more opportunities we have to move toward a more sustainable pathway. And um, I think Ask Nature is a great way to link into the biomimicry world. So in thinking about your lifestyles, your businesses, the products you produce, the buildings you design, how can they adapt and evolve? How can they create conditions conducive to life? Those are the questions that you can ask. There's a whole series of life's principles around how to go about doing that. It's another sort of piece to biomimicry process that maybe we can get into into the question and answer period. And I'll just leave you with this slide. Each species is a masterpiece. And um, there's a lot of elegance in nature, a lot to be learned. Um, this is a lot of research and development has gone into perfecting the way nature lives successfully on this planet. And so there's a lot to learn so that we can live successfully on the planet in the same con under the same pressures and conditions that these animals have been successful and have figured it out already. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Amanda Sturgeon and she's going to talk about biophilia, the more aesthetic, spiritual side. Well, good evening. Um, I am delighted to be here tonight to talk about biophilic design, and I think the two subjects, biomimicry, that Nicole um, so wonderfully described for you, and biophilic design are wonderful partners um, in our pathway towards reconnecting with nature. Um, so, uh, Nicole referred to E.O. Wilson at the end of her presentation, and E.O. Wilson really popularized uh, the term biophilia uh, with his book, Biophilia, here um, in the center of the slide. And uh, later he worked with uh, Dr. Stephen Kellett, a Yale professor um, in social ecology, um, who wor they worked together to create the biophilia hypothesis, and then Stephen Kellett has gone on to do a lot of research about how biophilia relates to um, the relationship between people and nature in terms of um, buildings. And a couple of books here um, that have been released, uh, the Biophilic Design book, a series of essays on biophilic design, uh, just came out a few years ago. And I'll refer to these throughout the presentation, but really the biophilia hypothesis um, is suggesting that there is an instinctive bond between human beings and other living systems. Um, those of you are familiar, I'm sure many of you are, with E.O. Wilson's work, uh, where he talks about how we as a species have been hunter-gatherers for like 99.99% of our human existence on the planet. Um, and he talks about how that informs our um, ability to relate to space and within space. And um, biophilic design is really drawing on some of those concepts um, that are often subconscious to us. Uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, I just returned from a fellowship to Italy where I was studying biophilic design in a tiny little um, southern Tuscan hill town called Civita, um, a fellowship with the Northwest Institute for Architectural and Urban Studies in Italy. Um, and uh, why I wanted to study this subject there is because, uh, you know, this is a town that's um, 3,000 or more uh, years of history. Um, it's built um, on Etruscan uh, structures that are embedded in the rock and has been evolved over time. And uh, there's an incredible connection to place here um, that uh, 
Stephen Kellett outlines as being, you know, the two sort of pieces of biophilic design, having a connection to our place and also having um, an organic or naturalistic design. And for me, uh, Chivita and many of the Tuscan hill towns are really um, uh, incredible examples of biophilic design. And so uh, you'll see lots of slides um, throughout of uh, Chivita. Um, the differences between biomimicry and biophilic design, how do they build on each other? Um, biomimicry is, it really can be used as a strategy within biophilic design. Um, you know, as Nicole um, mentioned, uh, biomimicry is uh, it being inspired by nature to create um, products or um, different elements of a building potentially. Um, biophilia or biophilic design is really looking at the social side of how we as people connect with our place and connect with nature. And, and biophilic design, when the biophilia piece is combined with design, is really referring to buildings. And why is it important? Um, you know, for myself practicing as an architect for um, a long time, it's, um, it's amazing to me that we are surrounded by a lot of buildings that, that lack a sense of place. Um, there's a sense of placelessness to a lot of the buildings that we're creating and building and a lot of the spaces that we spend time in. You know, many of us spend time in windowless offices, um, you know, where we're secluded from the outside world. We don't get to uh, breathe fresh air during the day, hear birds sing, um, or we're very disconnected. And so biophilic design is really trying to create a pathway for us to understand how to uh, connect with our place again. And I think it's important to say that it's not new by any means. Um, you know, we can see here in the Cinque Terre, one of the five little towns um, on the northwest coast of Italy, um, that people have been coexisting with their place for uh, thousands of years in a, in a way that um, is pretty harmonious with the resources that they have, the, the geography, the history, the culture of their place and of, of their um, site. And so, um, you know, another sort of background as to why it's important for us to reconnect with nature, you know, building on E.O. Wilson's um, theories that, you know, we as a species need to interact with nature in order to have a full loving life. Um, you know, there's been a lot of more work done, and for me it's sort of a, was a horrifying moment when Richard Loof came out with the concept of nature deficit disorder. Obviously not the only person to have written about it, um, but having a couple of children myself to think that children are becoming more and more disconnected from nature. Um, it's pretty scary. And there have been quite a few um, studies and scientific studies that look at the benefits of nature um, in schools when kids have daylight in their spaces, their test scores improve, um, their ability to be creative. Um, improved cognitive function. There's even a study that shows in um, hospitals when you have a view of nature in your window, um, you, can, you will heal faster than if you look out at a brick wall, for example, or have no window at all. Um, and the other, I think, really interesting thing around biophilic design is the neuroaesthetic piece. There's new neuroaesthetic studies happening, particularly in the UK, that are looking what is the commonality between all of us in what we find is beautiful. And so far, the studies are showing us that we all think nature is beautiful. So nature, in some form or another, is beautiful to all of us. It's a common platform or a common language for us to talk about uh, beauty and um, what, what makes us thrive in terms of a spiritual, emotional, mentally health, healthy um, individual or community. So how can we get back to uh, buildings that make us jump for joy? Um, and uh, I know my kids always jump for joy when we go out to Shai Shai Beach <laughs> once a year. And this is a picture a friend took of my son jumping for joy. Um, you know, how can we feel like this when we're in our buildings? You know, what will it take for us to feel like this? Um, <laughs> I would love to see as someone that's been the designer of buildings. I would love to see us all feel like that when we go into spaces. I just, I just want to be inside because we're spending most of our time inside. We should feel like this way this way when we go inside spaces. Um, you know, Stephen Kellett has made a really good uh, attempt at trying to, and there's various versions of this, at trying to uh, classify what we mean by biophilic design and what the elements are that would um, make a building connect with place and have its naturalistic um, forms. And he came up with six different design elements um, that I'll go through in a little bit more detail with some visuals to. Um, illustrate uh, what he means by these. But um, environmental features, 
um, natural shapes and forms, natural patterns and processes, light and space, place-based relationships, and evolved human nature relationships. And I think the evolved human nature relationships particularly sort of builds on some of E.O. Wilson's work about us as this hunter-gatherer sort of makeup needing um, prospect and refuge, for example. You know, I think all of you have been in a restaurant where it's busy and full and the only tables left are in the middle of the room, right? We're all sort of lined up around the edge with our backs to the wall, um, allowing us to see out. Uh, we want to, want to understand what's, what's um, in front of us and be able to have some preparation for that. So um, environmental features, and these are these are parts that uh, we're all familiar with, to be able to have views and vistas, um, to be able to have sunlight, have a relationship with natural materials, and, and you know, we really see this in Civita and in many of the old Italian um, Tuscan hill towns, where people were really building with, with what they had, with the earth beneath them. Um, but also, you know, there was a sense, a, a deeper connection with that prospect and refuge. And often you were building towns that were somewhat defensive to the enemy. <laughs> and you wanted to be able to have, you know, vistas and views around you in order to make sure that you weren't being invaded or attacked at certain times. Um, but, you know, a really great example of some of the features that... Um, come up with in, in environmental features and how we're connected with, with our materials and nature. And uh, it's been, you know, Stephen Kell's talked about direct and indirect relationships to nature and relationships to place. And direct being, you know, when we're immersed in nature, we're, we're taking a hike in the forest, for example. A lot of the relationships to nature that we have within buildings tend to be indirect. So they tend to be about, you know, the use of materials, the ability to see out, um, or ability to have sunlight, uh, connection with water or animals, for example. Um, a couple more examples of environmental features. Um, <coughs> you know, bringing water into a building. Uh, I've also seen some studies recently that looked at the benefits of having some kind of water sound or some kind of water relationship in healthcare projects and how it can really help people to heal faster. Um, also, you know, the use of really natural materials here and this, um, you know, image to the left where we really let nature just sort of overtake our buildings. Um, the second category is uh, talking about natural shapes and forms. So this is the Eden Project um, in the UK, in Cornwall, that uh, really did use, actually, biomimicry. It's a really great example of how biomimicry, I think, and biophilic design really intersect. And there's actually a great TED talk by the, uh, by the architect of this building. If you um, look it up and you look up Eden Project, um, you'll see it. But they looked at, at what nature would do to cover a space like this. This is basically a greenhouse botanical space. And uh, came up with the concept of a bubble. Um, what would nature do to, to cover a space like this? And so each of those little cells is actually a, a bubble. It's inflated to some extent. Um, it's a two-layer uh, plastic. And so I think it's an example of where biomimicry has been used to create elements of a building that then really celebrates and, and tries to rediscover a place. This was an old mine that um, was uh, rejuvenated. And, um, you know, again, the use of natural forms in a way that makes a lot of sense from a biophilic design perspective. Each of these little pop-ups is allowing the sun to be tracked through the day and allowing sunlight uh, throughout the space so they all face in, in a different direction and you're able to track the sun inside the space as it moves through the day, um, allowing us to connect with um, the time of day and the weather outside. Um, natural patterns and processes is the other category, and, and it includes things such as the patina, allowing the patina of time and age to inform our buildings. You know, in Chivita, there were several earthquakes, one every five years or so for about 100 years, between the 1750s and 1850s. Um, and many, much of the town actually dropped away into the valley, and ruins are still visible on the side of buildings. Um, you know, my sense is, is that if this was in the U.S., that would all have been cleared away and demolished by now. <laughs> but um, being able to be connected with that story and that history of this place is a really important part of, of who the community is here. There aren't many people left living in Chivita, but um, allowing those stories to be told is something I think we can really learn from as we're building in this culture. Um, the other part of natural patterns and processes is allowing the connection between inside and outside um, to be celebrated. And how can we blur those spaces so that we can be sheltered from um, 
sun, uh, we can be sheltered from the weather, but we can still be immersed in nature and be partly outside. And it depends on the climate, of course, but relating to what your climate is. Light and Space, this is a project, actually one of the first uh, certified living building challenge projects that um, the Omega Center in upstate New York, um, where they really did allow sunlight to come in the project, um, but also, you know, balanced it in the backside with sort of this diffuse daylight. So there's lots of different patterns of light that happen in this space. When you're there at different times, you see the sun moving through the room, um, and it, it connects you with the outside in a very direct way. And then I think um, you know, one of the oldest examples of, uh, of architecture, the Pantheon, where the entire space is lit by this, this opening at the top of the building, um, open to the sky, and it's just the most powerful demonstration of light of a space that I have ever been into. And um, I think really reminds us of how we can be using light as a, as a key way to connect ourselves back to nature. So how can we develop place-based relationships also? Um, you know, the connection to place is one of the key things of biophilic design. And you know, just the roofs in, um, in Italy, where uh, the layers and the patterns uh, are related to um, the craftsmanship and the culture and what can be made locally and what can be transported, um, really start to connect you to, um, to a detail of the place that can only really happen in that particular place and is very hard to replicate. And a more local example, um, Islandwood, the treehouse, um, I think gives kids an amazing opportunity to be connected to the outside, but be partially inside, um, and also to, to sort of relate to being in the trees or in the canopy to some degree. Um, the last uh, grouping I wanted to talk about of biophilic design is the evolved human nature relationships. And uh, this is the Sagrada Familia by uh, Gaudi in Barcelona. Um, which really does replicate and, and imitate um, natural forms in order to create a spiritual uh, experience. And probably the most spiritual building I have ever been into, which is not a church or a place of worship, is the Sydney Opera House. Um, and, uh, you know, Jorn Utzen, the architect here, decided what, um, realized what it would be like to, to transition people through a space from the main harbor or bay, uh, Circular Quay on Sydney Harbor, um, you gradually transcend a series of steps until suddenly you find yourself inside the building and that pathway continues all the way along the side of the, um, of the opera and the symphony halls to the point at which you get where you're in, to the end and you're, you're just subjected to this amazing view of Sydney Harbour. Um, I think it's an amazing example of not just a natural form, um, whether you, know, you find that appealing or you don't, but also an understanding of how you relate people to a place. And a, a quote that I really like by Jornitsen, um, light God's eldest daughter is a principal beauty in a building. Um, I think it's, uh, it's something that we've lost sight of as a group of architects and designers, unfortunately, that, that would be easy um, for us to find again. So I just want to talk a little bit about how does all of that in biophilic design relate to the, the work that I do as a certification director of Living Building Challenge. And uh, within the Living Building Challenge, which is 20 requirements to um, move us towards a restorative future. And we have more information on the tables there, and I can certainly talk to you more about the program. Um, but we require, one of our requirements is that uh, designers address biophilia um, in those categories that I outlined and um, not in a way that they've designed their building or their neighborhood, and then they've told us, you know, well, this relates to nature or this relates to nature, um, but in a way that, that changes their design process and how they may have designed the project in the first place. So the Living Building Challenge really does take uh, from nature its inspiration. Um, how can we design buildings that uh, really act like a flower? Uh, they're pollution-free. Um, they harvest all their own energy and water, but they're also beautiful. And uh, I think that question of what is beautiful um, really does come back to the commonality between all of us, which is uh, nature. And I'll end on a quote um, by Stephen Kellett, uh, that the values of biophilia require we seek to harmonize nature with humanity, if we're to achieve a just, secure, sustainable, fulfilling, and loving future. And, um, you know, biophilia means love of life, and uh, I think, you know, a biophilic design really takes a love or a caring of a place 
and a, and a uh, culture and a history in order to, to be realized. And with that, I'll finish, and I think we're going to move to questions. I'm a big fan of Buckminster Fuller, who's the guy who really popularized um, those domes, but he had a tremendous amount of impact on the whole idea of sustainability. He really tried to look at nature and uh, human beings. And um, one of the things he talked about is this idea of uh, synergy, synergistics, that um, the, the sum of the parts, is, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, the question is, though, as we get more and more com complex and try to mimic behavior, can you know what the whole is going to be while you're putting the parts together uh, beforehand? Is this a, a difficulty in creating even a complex building as, as we try to, to mimic be, uh, biology or uh, uh, create biophilic structures? So the question I kind of have is, uh, are we still developing complex buildings where we may not know how everything really fits together until you make it and then find out that it's not actually quite as efficient as you expected by adding up each of the pieces. Uh, do we have any evidence, one way or the other, how that would work in a, uh, using a biomimic uh, approach? Well, like I mentioned in um, my presentation, nature takes the path of least resistance. It doesn't use any more energy than it absolutely has to um, in creating the materials that it uses. Um, one of the simple laws of nature is that it uses simple common building blocks. Nature's materials are formed from hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, plentiful materials, um, not uh, bromine, mercury, lead, arsenic, silica, materials that we like to use that um, that aren't as plentiful, that are more uh, rare earth elements. Um, and so I think in building, there's a parallel there in using simplicity in design, using plentiful materials, um, using simple shapes that can be repeated. Um, and I don't think we're quite there in our building today. I think in buildings that um, are highly flexible spaces that are modular, that really tailor to the re building relationships with the interior occupants and allowing them to do their daily activities and not feel hindered, I think is an important aspect of, of um, green building. And I think those are things that we can learn in nature. So I think I'd have to say that it's, you know, Thinking about simplicity in design, um, plentiful materials is important in building. So you're actually you're actually saying if you use biomimicry, you probably actually are simplifying our processes. Whereas today we seem to be making things more complex with our standard processes. So it would be a simple, uh, it would be a simplification, and therefore it would be quite as big of a problem. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the big uh, green building best practices is multifunctional design. And nature is a master of that. If you think about like a mallard duck you might see at a park nearby, um, when a duck cleans its feathers, it's preening. Well, when it's preening, it's also moisturizing the, um, it's also um, putting a uh, moisture layer on the, on waterproofing the feathers. And it's also at the same time moisturizing its beak. And in the presence of sunlight, the, um, uh, lotion that it uses to waterproof and moisturize the beak turns to vitamin D. So it becomes a nutrient for the duck. And so in the one simple process of cleaning its feathers, it's performing four functions. That's multifunctional design. And again, that's nature's way of using as little energy as possible to do as many different functions. Well, that, and that gets back into kind of bio, biophilia. Um, uh, when you show the dome, often a biophilic design, like a dome. We actually, it looks really pretty. Uh, and there's a lot of good structural engineering aspects for having a dome structure. It includes, it includes a great amount of space on a very small surface area, things like that. But because of the curved, curvature nature of the building, uh, it's very hard to make uh, mass market furniture uh, using industrial age assembly lines to create the 
the heating and cooling systems that they might need in different structures with different curvatures. So is there a way to incorporate the biophilic design of a building like that and still maintain some of the efficiencies or does it have inherent efficiencies that, that beat a lot of our, our modern uh, square structure? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think many of the structures that we have, like I showed the one of the sort of classic big box uh, store of some kind um, at the beginning of my presentation. And, um, you know, the reason I think we have a lot of projects, uh, buildings like that, where we don't really know where we are. We could be in a Home Depot in Seattle. We could be in a Home Depot in Atlanta, right? We don't, the, there's really no connection to place. Is really because we want to make building something that is, you know, we can commodify and we can replicate and, and make cheap and reasonable um, in terms of a cost perspective. And I think biophilic design is really calling for um, a movement away from that where we actually are looking at each place and what's appropriate to each place. So where there may be a dome appropriate in one place and function, um, it may not, that may not be appropriate in the next place. And so it doesn't mean I don't think that things can't be replicated. Um, but I think it's calling for a much more careful examination of what's appropriate in each place rather than simply repeating a pattern no matter where it is in the world. So actually, and this is one of the questions from the audience, is the idea of feng shui um, as a way of placing a structure inside a, its surroundings. Is, is that a large part of, of biophilia or an aspect of biophilia that could be uh, applied to a, a much larger uh, global uh, uh, culture than just in the kind of bits and pieces you see. Yeah, I mean, I think I see biophilia personally as being a movement very similar to what we've seen with food, where we're seeing, you know, the 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 um, rise rising or increase of slow food or local food, or organically grown food. Um, I think we really need to begin that movement with our buildings, where we have you know, slow buildings, <laughs> and we have buildings that are local, and we have buildings where, you know, those that have created them have really sat and listened and watched and um, taken account of, of what's in that place. And so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, if we build with biophilic design, the buildings would have quite a lot of feng shui in terms of, you know, their character and connection to their place. Um, you know, and I see it as a movement that's sort of similar to the other movements we're seeing, where people are really trying to get a grasp more of their local community, their local culture, and be more rooted within it. Um, and I think biophilic design speaks to that. Well, mm -hmm. one of the things I, I like both of you to, to kind of talk about this is uh, both of these ideas, biomimicry, biophilia, require uh, a lot more thinking. We're, we're talking about really putting a lot more cognition into our, our building decisions, and of course, that slows things down to, to do it. We don't have the processes to do that very effectively, uh, yet we're dealing in, you know, in a world, an economy, where you sometimes need to do things quickly. Uh, buildings are being funded by people that want to make the money back on the buildings. There's a tremendous amount of processes that uh, may not be interested in thinking deeply about getting a building up. Uh, so I want to ask each of you, I'll ask you first, um, Nicole, is, you know, what are some of the ways to attack that? What are some of the ways to make it easier to have that time to think, but still meet the pressures from uh, the economic pressures that are out there? Mm -hmm. Well, biomimicry is a design discipline that's best served, you know, at the very upfront portions of a project where you're doing some pre preliminary planning and thinking about how you're going to frame the approach on the project. Um, and thinking about what you're going to design and how that's going to impact the place. I think um, when you start to consider cost issues, budget constraint, you know, budget constraints and costs, when you start thinking about time constraints, when you start thinking about the um, goals and desires of the client and their own constraints from investors, you know, that can definitely complicate the process. But I think that it can also bring great resolution and clarity to design when you start to think about app applying biomimicry not as a technical cumbersome design process but in a thought process that takes you through the whole sort of um, approach to how you're going to carry things forward from the sensitivities of the site. Um, to elements that should be preserved, elements that 
um, should be restored and how does that then feed into the massing stacking the orientation the size and shape of the building on that site and then also just in thinking about nature's design principles around how nature has succeeded so well on this planet and those are elements um, that parallel with biophilia in terms of being locally attuned and responsive um, you know, you see in, uh, in the mountains, you don't, rabbits don't have big ears that stick up into the sky, but in the desert, they surely do because they need a massive amount of surface area to exhaust heat quickly. And so um, that's an example of being locally tuned and responsive. And also in the example I, I talked about in multifunctional design, um, I think that's a really good approach to building in efficiencies in design if you can think about what is the true function of this building what who am i serving how are occupants going to um, how are they going to behave in this building um, how is it sort of connect with the surrounding community and design for those true functions and in those functions you can use then life's principles um, to then apply a more efficient streamlined design so I think it's this upfront thinking and just sort of making a commitment to thinking about things in a different way. And I think that biomimicry just helps to direct the team in a way that's very focused instead of sort of general green building practices where there may be a checklist or just sort of a, an a la carte menu that you choose from that are all great things to do, but they may not be best for the building. You know, that's actually going to get, and I'll, I'll address this to you too, this part of this question, but um, uh, a tremendous amount of the buildings that we have now and the, the way they've developed, we have almost 100 years of experience on putting those together, what the codes need to be. Uh, organizations, communities feel much more comfortable with those sorts of buildings because there's a tremendous amount of experience that goes into their construction. So uh, a lot of what I think, you know, biophilia and biomimical I have to deal with is overcoming that uh, fear, uh, providing time for the community to, to contemplate it and actually uh, move forward. So uh, part of what would be interesting to hear is if, if you have an, an idea of, of have there been community successes that move through those processes and overcome some of the things that might slow down? Um, yes, I think for sure. I mean, I don't know that doing um, a building with biophilic design necessarily um, slows down a process as much as uh, simplifies it and causes us to consider what's really valuable. Um, and I think biophilic design really speaks as much about ethics, love, morals <laughs> as anything and that it really questions our greed as a human race. <laughs> and our need to do things fast and for the most profit possible. And um, I think it draws a deeper ethic um, out of us uh, when we have to really consider our place and respect for our place and our culture and our history. So, um, you know, there's been many communities I think, that have stopped and said, okay, how are we gonna build a place that's important for this community that speaks to this community? Um, you know, one of the Living Building Challenge registered projects is a, is a cob house that uh, the owners built um, by hand themselves and they had to challenge lots of building codes. Um, they uh, pretty much broke all of them. They had to make friends with the building inspector, you know, they had to connect a flush toilet and then, you know, as soon as they got their um, occupancy certificate, take it out and then put their composting toilets in. I mean, they're pretty creative and, and what I'm seeing with people that are choosing to do the Living Building Challenge, for example, and that's not the only pathway necessarily, but, um, you know, is that people get pretty darn determined to do this stuff. They will not let anything get in their way and um, what I've seen more and more with Living Building Challenge is people just being so excited that there's a framework um, that can help move them towards um, not just biophilic design, but you know a truly restorative future. And uh, people will, will get around the rules. They'll work out a way to do it. Um, I think we're pretty creative <laughs> in that way as a species. <laughs> well, I've, I've got one question from the audience that I'd, I'd love to hear your, your answer to. On it. So this be, but it's like a test question, but it's great. Is, um, is the Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing biomimetic, biophilic, or neither? 
Hmm. I'd call Good it bio-inspired. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there was a true biomimetic process involved in the Beijing Stadium. Certainly looks like a bird's nest. Um, doesn't necessarily use uh, life-friendly materials, um, uh, but it's definitely bio-inspired. You know, there was definitely inspiration taken from nature there. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, taking inspiration from nature in a form of a building is a really fabulous first step towards biophilic design. Um, but, you know, the reason I showed the six elements or six categories is because, you know, taking inspiration from nature to create form is not the only way that we create biophilic design. Um, you know, if there's no relationship to place, for example, or culture or history, um, you know, the use of sunlight, water, air, um, all, all the things that I outlined, then, you know, just taking one, one portion of biophilic design doesn't necessarily make something biophilic, but, but I do think um, we've been inspired uh, for thousands of years by natural forms, and, and I hope we continue to be. I mean, I like that part of that stadium that they did, they did take inspiration from something natural I thought was, was great, personally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, over here. I really appreciate this. Uh, both, con both, both concepts, biomimicry and biomimetics and biophilia. Um, two questions. One is that how would a potential practitioner of this obtain training? What curriculum might this be found in? And two, how would a potential uh, co consumer of this uh, get access to, you know, to this in considering uh, construction of a residential or an industrial structure. And then two, um, in this concept of biophilia in, in being in harmony with a, with a natural system, it's always a seemed to us that particularly in all our structures and, 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 and our residential structures, uh, we spend most of our time inside and that the night uh, is a is a part of the natural cycle and that we're separated from. So I'm just curious if you've seen any any uh, studies or any uh, examples where the night has been more incorporated into um, either residential or, well, particularly residential because those are the places that you're at at night. So potential practitioners, how would they get the training? Potential consumers, how do they get the product and the night sky and access to the night? <laughs> well, I could start in reverse, if you like. The, the night sky, I mean, we have seen a movement uh, towards actually uh, commercial buildings and um, particularly within the U.S. Green Building Council's lead program to try and address light trespass and light um, during night to reduce the light burden of cities, which is actually you know, what then starts to affect our experience in residential areas. I mean, I live on Bainbridge and I can see the lights of Seattle at night still. Um, and so you know, there has been an awareness or an acknowledgement that uh, you know, if commercial industrial buildings all turn off their lights at night, that we'll actually be able to restore a sense of night, especially around cities or urban areas, and allow nocturnal species to thrive as well. Um, so that's the part that I know about sort of night sky um, issues. In terms of education of practitioners, um, I know the, that uh, Nicole can talk about the Biomimicry Institute's um, program. Um, you know, I do recommend some reading. I will say that biophilic design, there's no, um, there's no like easy course or training, uh, you know, to sort of, to get there. I think that's really a piece that needs to be um, worked on next is like what are the steps, what's the framework that we can use. Um, you know, the book I mentioned, Biophilic Design, would be a really good way, I think, for people who are interested uh, to, to go further, and I can leave this out here that people can look at, um, write down the details if you need them. Um, I would say on education, you know, within the Living Building Challenge program, we have regular education events. I did want to say that uh, Stephen Kellett is actually speaking coincidentally here in Seattle next week. Um, so that would be a way to hear, um, hear it from the horse's mouth, as it were, <laughs> and talk to him a little bit more about his work. Um, I think he's showing the film that he's just completed, um, mostly at that event, and then it'll be a short lecture. So um, 
so those are some resources, and I could also connect you with a few more if you like after this. Okay. Um, yeah, there are a number of different resources. Ask Nature is a good one. Um, there's a wonderful book called The Way Nature Works, which I think should be on everybody's shelf. It's got um, incredible graphics, uh, great understanding in very simplistic terms of uh, natural systems um, across all different ecotones around the world. Um, and uh, Ian McCarg's The Way Nature Works, I think, is really good, too, in terms of just uh, early um, understanding of designing with nature's principles in mind, um, or just called designing with nature. Anyway, um, the Biomimicry Institute has great um, uh, educational courses. They have a nine-month and a two-year certificate program. Um, there's also about biologists at the design table training um, that you can take, uh, biomimicryinstitute.org. There is also a newly emerging uh, Puget Sound biomimicry network. And there's some folks here. Um, maybe you can raise your hand <laughs> so you can come talk to them and get hooked into others that are excited about biomimicry. Um, there's also a biomimicry Oregon network, too, if there's anybody here from Portland. Um, we're having an emergence event on September 21st, and uh, we're going to have a keynote speaker, a two-year certificate graduate, and um, so that should be pretty exciting, too. Uh, so those are some good resources. In terms of night sky, um, I think there's a real need in urban areas for people to connect with the night sky from a biophilic sense to connect with the stars and to be able to see um, a world outside of an urban environment, I think is really important because we are bombarded with so much stimulus that to be able to see the quiet of the sky and the stars I think is really important. Um, birds and bats migrating through, light disorients them, and they'll actually, there's studies of um, birds and bats just circling um, around, uh, the, circling above urban areas being disoriented by the light and not being able to figure out where to navigate toward um, because the darkness doesn't, that usually allows them to move in the direction they need to, they get a nice <laughs> duck ring. There's a duck, <laughs> a nighttime duck. <laughs> They lose, they lose sight of their pathway. So in building, <laughs> do you have others? Very well timed. Yeah, that was. I was like, where is it? <laughs> um, so yeah, the night, night sky, I think, you know, there's studies on uh, decreasing light pollution and different ways of going about that. There's the dark sky uh, initiative. There's a national institute around building for, for dark sky um, in urban areas. And so I'd say okay. it's really important and we need to integrate it into design, surely. Uh -huh. okay. Well, we've got uh, several questions to kind of cover this, overlap one another, so I'm gonna meld them all together. Um, the way we design buildings and divine, design communities is actually almost mass produced. Uh, whether you build a, a, a building in Houston or build it in New York, or build it in Los Angeles, they're all kind of built the same, even though those are, though those are very different climates that each of those are, are built in. So particularly looking at the Pacific Northwest, are there any insights into um, biomimicry or biophilic uh, designs that uh, would be really conducive to living in the Pacific Northwest, particularly with looking at things like uh, uh, um, SAD, seasonal affective disorder? things like that that uh, might have to be dealt with. So examples of biomimetic design you know, in the yeah, Pacific is, Northwest? Are, are there any things that would be uh, directly applicable to just living in the Pacific Northwest that would be a good design here? You may not want to use it down in Houston, but uh, mm -hmm. work well in a, in a cooler, more northerly climate. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously in, in our climate we have you know more heating days than cooling days, and so having a real tight thermal envelope and focusing on the efficiency of the architectural design before thinking about mechanical systems is always really important. And um, you know the way that different animals build their homes, they don't have the um, 
they don't have the luxury of um, calling up carrier and train and, and installing a heating cooling system. They sort of have to figure it out by the building materials that they have readily available around them. And so I think in terms of um, the tightness of, of the envelope, ventilation, um, in terms of you know, readily available materials in the area, um, I think is, is really important in design and just focusing on the shelter itself first before thinking about the equipment that houses it, I think is very close to um, biomimicry. Okay, how about biophilic? Yeah. Well, I think we've actually seen a Northwest architecture emerge um, in the last 15 years. I'm thinking of the work of some of the architecture firms such as Miller Hall and Cutler Anderson and um, Methune where they really have addressed what a Northwest architecture might be like. And um, not surprisingly, it's fairly heavy in terms of wood structure, because that's our resource here. It wouldn't be right for us to be building you know, stone houses out of tufa shipped from Italy in the slides that I showed you and the way it is in Civita. Um, but they're typically buildings also that are addressing natural ventilation. Um, we have a climate here that we don't really need cooling if we design in the right way. Um, their wood structures, they're usually really maximizing daylight uh, because we do get a little daylight deprived, <laughs> just a little, um, by the time February comes around. And they're also really opening up to um, the outdoor spaces and taking their inspiration, I think, from um, forests, from the water that we have and from the geography that we have. And I think we're just, we're just seeing it emerge and I think we see it much more in houses and environmental education centers and some schools um, gradually and much less in our downtown portfolio of buildings and our industrial buildings and our hospitals. Um, and I think that's, that's the next challenge is how do we make those buildings that are somewhat more complex uh, currently um, really adapt to their place um, and to a, a language of the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, I think one yeah. element of biomimicry design, yes. Go ahead. Oh, no, okay. Um, is in uh, not only in thinking about thermal performance of the envelope, but in you know harnessing free energy, and that's something that nature does very well. And thinking about solar exposure and um, trade winds, and thinking about how you can take advantage of that warmth provided by the sun at different times of the year across different seasons. Um, the fact that you know trees shade in the summer through the leaves, and they the, through the leaves they photosynthesize and create energy for for the tree. But then in the fall, the, the leaves fall, the trees respire, they go into rest, and that sunlight then penetrates down to the ground to keep it warm to incubate seeds so they can emerge in the spring. Um, also, in allowing water to um, allowing water to hit the branches and down the tree trunk and down to the center of the tree so it can replenish its, uh, its water systems when it needs to at a time of rest so that the buds can emerge in the spring. Um, there's all sort of, in, sort of inspiration that we can take from nature and I think free energy is a big part that we're not taking full advantage of. Interesting uh, uh, example of when you went to Shai Shop. I've been going there for every year for 30 years. <laughs> and to just give you a little factoid, people squatted that area prior to it becoming a national park and built uh, hand-built houses and lived there year-round with these wonderful pieces of uh, architecture without architects uh, back in the, uh, the 60s uh, to very early 1970s. But that's not what I want to <laughs> You also brought up the, uh, the Living Future Institute, which is uh, wonderful examples up in the conference uh, in April in Vancouver for the uh, Living Cities. But the question I have is a little bit more difficult. Uh, given the, the, the social construct, the economic construct we're in now, unfortunately, you know, we're dealing with this corporate uh, uh, focus on short-term gains, long-term uh, they, they ignore the long-term uh, 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 profits or long-term gains. It's all short-term profits, and that's unfortunate. And you gave some, you, you were excellent uh, in, in, in the questions at the beginning. Do you have any examples of how we could, in fact, show other municipalities that are not like Seattle 
that do not have that wonderful building that's going up at 15th and Madison, how we could uh, show them the economic advantages of, 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 of a long-term future of, okay, we're building for 50 to 100 years. What, what have you done? What, what examples have you seen? Uh, what, what examples can you give to us that we can make that argument by saying, yeah, it's may, it may cost a little more right now, but, but this is what you're going to get in the long-term economic. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Um, I think that what uh, the U.S. Green Building Council's program lead has done is, is it's been able to be mandated um, politically uh, throughout the country, which has seen a, a huge rise in sort of those first steps towards, you know, addressing efficiencies in buildings, um, not towards really biophilic design or restorative buildings yet. Um, you know, I, I travel here and there giving um, presentations on the Living Building Challenge and workshops, and I recently went down to Atlanta where we, we don't have any projects registered with Living Building Challenge. And, um, you know, the group there were, uh, were feeling frustrated. <laughs> They've been on a long-term drought, and yet they have no water policies to be able to use rainwater, for example. Um, and you know, really looking to the Northwest for how some of our water policy and water research that we've been doing lately could be transformed and used. And, and that group is actually creating a Living Building Challenge collaborative where they're gonna, their first order of business is going to be to try and change water policies in Atlanta. So, I mean, I do see that the work that we're doing in the Northwest, and you're right in that when you travel elsewhere in the country, we are quite far ahead of many places. Um, that it is beginning to be transferred and it's a small group of people, you know, it's a handful of people that are, that are seeing what's happening elsewhere and are starting to try and, you know, get the wheels turning. Um, I mean, so that I am seeing that happen in the places that I've um, been traveling to and, and it is painfully slow sometimes. <laughs> um, but, but I do think that there's the will there for people who are tired of a sense of placelessness. They are tired of, um, of being in buildings that, that suffocate them in terms of you know, a spiritual, uh, emotional, you know, mentally healthy species. Um, and I do see that movement growing. But I mean, that's just what I see on the ground there, even though it's slower in some places than others. <laughs> um, you know, I can add to that. There's a whole um, there's a whole sort of philosophy around the business case for sustainability, and it has to do with cost savings and risk mitigation and brand enhancement and market positioning and thinking about what your competitors are doing and what sort of like federal legislation or state or local legislation is coming down the pike and what you need to pre be prepared for. And in thinking about areas like down in Atlanta or you know in the Gulf and um, yeah, and, and um, areas that have been susceptible to drought in Northern California and Arizona, for example, where they see the real challenges of scarcity of resources, they're butting up against it on a daily basis. Um, so that's where you start to see the issues of risk really come to play and decisions have to be made quickly. Um, I think in bringing those sort of tidbits to light and thinking about the long-term upfront cost savings and incentives, the long-term incentives, um, and having buildings that are more structurally um, sound and able to um, um, last you know, over 100 years for, that's, that's necessary for building today. Um, I think is important. And so talking to those points, um, you know, companies are looking to differentiate themselves from their competition, so in thinking about brand enhancement, um, I think is a big play for folks these days and in, in market positioning and trying to get the, the edge um, against their competitors is something that we found speaks to people in terms of wanting to do something a little different because it is the, the minority that's interested in doing something different, something better, um, and it's really the majority that's interested in coming along with the pack, and so it's these sort of uh, business um, objectives that speak to people, and that's what you need to be talking to in order to get their ear and to start thinking about doing something a little different. 
yeah, and talking about precedent too, so it's, it's not so scary, and it's, uh, other people have already jumped out there ahead of them, so they can too. You know, I have, I have one question that fits in with this is, um, and, and this is something I, I found very fascinating when I read about it is, in uh, a lot of the third world slums, they're now using two liter bottles filled with water and embedding them in the roofs of the corrugated roofs. And those are now providing the equivalent of a 50 watt bulb without any need for electricity because they had no electricity and they had no holes in the roof that, that would work. So it's a very cheap, very quick way to get natural light inside um, third world slums. So one of the questions I have is, is that would some of these ideas of biomimicry actually perhaps find greater purchase in those parts of the world, some of the developing parts of the world, mm -hmm. than they might in the uh, um, uh, developed uh, countries, simply because they may be much more interested in just getting something that works cheaply, mm -hmm. rather than having to deal with all the processes. Do you see anything like that? The, the third world is picking up on a lot of biomimicry, maybe more than we are? Well, I think they may be doing it without knowing it. Um, I think what's amazing in third world countries is although there are issues with um, disease and overall health and longevity of, 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 of people's um, lives and in terms of just quality of life and level of education and access to needs, um, health services, those sorts of things. They are closer to the elements. These people feel the forces of not having enough water or living in areas that are not healthy and have stale air or being prone to, you know, leaky roofs and they understand when it rains what it feels like. And, and so these people are closer to the pressures of the natural world and therefore I think they're more in tune with it and respond to it in ways that make sense. Um, and I think that's something in the Western world that we've sort of lost grasp of. We have buildings that fully shield us from the outside elements. We can be inside all day and not even know what temperature it is. And so that sort of disconnects us with the forces of the outside world. And then in that way, and in that sense, how to build appropriately to those forces. So I think that um, in third world countries, we can certainly stand to learn something there. I think Janine Benyus um, says that, it, that biomimicry is a reawakening. It's not a new discipline. This is an old way of thinking, an old design that we just need to become reconnected with. We, we, were, we were there once and we need to find it again. Um, and so I think that's one way to look at it. Um, Biomimicry is a really interesting tool, and I think one example I, I want to provide is um, I was working on a project in Woodburn, which is about 30 minutes south of Portland. Woodburn is an agricultural community, the largest um, minority majority population in Oregon is 52 percent Latino, and in this um, apartment complex, uh, Women, women in this uh, couple apartments together started planting vegetation in front of their windows. And so the, um, the property manager was asking what they were doing, and they said, well, these windows, there's too much heat gain. Um, and so they were planting shrubs to, and small trees to help block that heat gain and cool their apartments. Um, I, that's a connection that they still feel from living um, in their homeland that they've brought with them. And so I think that's an example of being close to nature in ways that many of us have forgotten. That's interesting. Um, one question we, uh, was brought up is that uh, one of the major places in, in America, let's take right now, right now, is uh, having to rebuild housing that's been destroyed by a natural disaster in Japan dealing with a atomic reactor. Um, uh, is this an area where biophilic designs could have some real leverage because they're buildings that need to be quickly designed that people are going to have to be put into and live either for a short term or perhaps a long term. We have the example of Katrina where they were being put into housing that was obviously unhealthy. Uh, is, are, are there anybody, is there anybody or any groups looking at using that as a point to bring biophilic designs um, into the mainstream? Yeah, I'm not so sure about the biophilic design in terms of quick modular housing, but there definitely has been a um, 
sort of an outbreaking of uh, folks designing green uh, prefab homes and modular homes, and there's actually quite a lot of options. Um, mostly, a lot of them were actually developed after Katrina and uh, quite commercially available to be built pretty quickly. Um, I think, you know, I think there's a, there's a pathway that we have gone down in terms of trying to design things quickly um, to shelter people that, like you say, has often been pretty unhealthy. Um, but there definitely are more simple options. And I think following a, a biophilic design method would allow us to come up with options that uh, would be a lot more simple and a lot more healthy by looking at you know what, what kind of shelter should happen in this place with this culture. Um, and how can we build it simply in the way that nature might build something to shelter us uh, in this place? Um, so I don't know that there's a lot of people doing that right now. There's certainly a lot of people doing green prefab modular housing, and um, that's growing uh, more and more. So. Well, because it, it brings up the whole point of we, we talked about having to think carefully beforehand, but mm -hmm. in a natural disaster, you really don't have an opportunity in, this, in that immediate sense. Um, and it's one of the odd things that, that gets back to uh, Book Minister Fuller also talked about the idea of uh, ephemeralization, that is doing, doing more with less. And that if you look at the progress of humanity and human culture over time, it's always been a progression from uh, more to doing more with less as time goes on. He actually believed that eventually we'd be doing everything with nothing, as it, as it were. Um, the, the, the question is, uh, does this actually fit with, with uh, a, a biophilic design, that we actually end up following that sort of ephemeralization of uh, a building design? Um, I think very much so, yeah. I mean, I think buildings, uh, uh, the, you know, nature isn't greedy and that it, it usually doesn't take, it doesn't take more than it needs. And, um, you know, I think biophilic design is really calling for us uh, as a species to follow in that pathway. Um, with our buildings and you know currently the amount of waste and um, excess that we have in our buildings it's often not a choice of whether you can afford it or not um, to choose marble shipped from overseas for a foyer versus you know looking at how you might generate the energy for the building in a renewable way I mean the, the money is there to build these buildings and to do um, extra features that aren't needed um, so it's it's really a choice, I think, of where we're choosing to put our money and what we're choosing to do with our resources um, and how we design buildings. So, I mean, I, I don't, I think that biophilic design can really lead us down a path of doing things in a much simple way, which will not necessarily be more expensive. Um, you know, I think ultimately it's about how we choose to use our precious resources wisely. And it's showing us a pathway, I think, to do that in a much simpler way. And, you know, that gets to, to an extent, there's, not everybody agrees <laughs> that biomimicry or biophilia is, is the right way to go. In fact, you know, you have critics who... Really? Who is, yeah, yeah, it's, what a surprise. <laughs> uh, I am shocked. But, but the fact is, and this is where I think it overlaps a little bit, is uh, what comes first, the design, the biomimicry design, or the engineering to make it, that then the, you rationalize that later. I mean. Uh, because obviously nature is a good engineer in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. and if you follow engineering processes, you can say, well, that's biomimicry, but it, is, it, it may not be, depending on just how the critics view how you, how you build things. So, so what is the difference between biomimicry design first versus engineering design first, and uh, uh, are there differences in the outcomes off of those two ways of looking at it? Well, there's different ways to, to use biomimicry process. And, um, you know, I didn't mean to say that uh, to focus on the envelope and don't even think about any mechanical systems in the building. Um, I think that it's a matter of um, placing weight and focus in design in how you go about thinking about the different uh, steps that you take to uh, heat and cool a building, make it comfortable for occupants. And starting with the mechanical design is not the way to go. Um, I think biomimicry, you can take an interesting process um, in biomimicry by thinking about 
um, a building and the real challenges that you're facing with it. You know, and that's done in an initial sort of workshop setting where you think about what are the real sort of big challenges we're going to have to face on this project, whether it's uh, a humidity issue, a noise issue, whether it's um, diversity of activities in the building that all need to be accommodated, whatever that challenge is. And if you can distill that down to a function, the functional level, um, and ask yourself not what, what are you trying to design, but what do you want your design to do? then at that level, that functional level, that's where you can start to look to nature and see how nature solves for that very same function, that very same challenge that you're facing in your design. And I think that leads to interesting outcomes in how to design the building and seek um, levels of efficiency that then play inform the whole engineering design process. Um, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, multifunctional design, in thinking about life-friendly materials, um, in thinking about feedback loops and being open to learning and how the building's going to be operated and how that sort of feeds into the type of equipment that would best serve that building and who's going to manage it. Um, there are ways of, of understanding the way nature works, and it's this collective term called life's principles, that you can apply then to the building design itself. And I think in thinking about the real challenges and the functions that you're trying to solve for, it's at that functional level that you can make the transition to the natural world and seek answers as to solve for that function. And if and if you do it in a very sort of authentic way, then you can come to conclusions where, sure, you might have a heating cooling system in the building, but all of a sudden it's downsized to um, a, a downsized, you know, half as much as you would have put in a conventional building. Okay, we've got a question over here at the mic. Yes, um, thank you both for coming. It's been really exciting to hear about nature-inspired design. Um, but I did have a question about the biggest and most invasive species on the planet, and that's humans, and whether or not human biology has inspired any of these kinds of designs, one, and two, whether or not there's data or studies that have demonstrated that um, uh, bio-inspired designs actually have changed human health outcomes. Yeah, I can uh, respond to that in terms of um, your first question and um, uh, the relationship. Sorry, can you just, <laughs> I want to make sure I'm answering it correctly. Uh, well, one question is, how have these designs been inspired by human biology? Yeah. And then um, if there's any studies or data to support or to show how human health outcomes have changed because of these types of designs? Yeah, so biophilic design really broadens the um, philosophy that people are part of nature uh, rather than people being a problem to the environment, that it's just if the people go away and we stop destroying the environment, then we'll all be okay. Um, you know, biophilic design is really uh, embracing people as part of nature and saying that, um, you know, we have a healthy, potentially, a healthy interactive relationship with nature where we can actually restore the ecology and we can um, be healthy participants in creating a healthy environment in many different ways. Um, so I think in that way, um, you know, it's a very human-inspired uh, approach uh, rather than looking at just protection um, uh, as an approach. Um, in terms of, um, you know, examples of where human health, there actually have been quite a few studies, and I mentioned one about uh, the hospital study that showed uh, that, you know, if you have a window that looks out onto nature in a hospital room, they've actually analyzed the healing time for people with, you know, very similar situations and um, through a sort of scientific study showed that having a relationship with nature while you're healing actually heals you faster. Um, you know, there's been some really great studies by Judith Heerwagen, who is a, here in Seattle and is co-author of this book um, that looks at productivity and health of people um, within 
all kinds of different um, building types a lot during go um, in government buildings and looks at uh, daylight in particular, access to fresh air, the ability to open and close windows, the ability to control your environment, and how that uh, can reduce you know, absenteeism and sick days. And um, So there actually is a wealth of, of science and sort of studies that are starting to build on that human health piece and their relationship to nature um, that are pretty interesting. Yeah, um, I can add to that. Um, you know, we are nature. People are part of nature. There's no doubt about that. And there's amazing things that we can learn about human physiology that speaks to the way nature operates. Um, for example, um, you know, a cell divides exactly 50 times to create a baby. And that's all it takes. From that point on, it grows and multiplies in cells. So. So that's an exa excellent example of building from simple common building blocks and replicating simple patterns and building in complexity from the ground up and thinking about design in a simplistic fashion to, to build form. Um, you know, another example is uh, fitting form to function. Um, our bones are, are actually a lattice network of, um, of structure, they're not solid. If they're made by our ingenious minds, we'd have solid bones maybe made out of titanium. I'm not sure. But um, nature has provide, created bones that are strong, yet they only use as much material as absolutely is needed. And that creates more of a, a lattice type structure in the interior of a bone. So it's very strong, very supportive but it's also lightweight. We don't want to spend our days burning tons of calories moving our heavy titanium bones around. And so I think we can learn a lot from, from people. We are nature. There's a lot to learn um, from about us. I think what's interesting in building human environments, and this is something that struck me when I saw um, Timothy Beatley's film on biophilia recently that's going to be played at Stephen Kellert's uh, transformational lecture series through Cascadia GBC. The movie um, is called The Nature of Cities. And one thing that was mentioned that I thought was really interesting and caught me is the fact that we need to be able to define human habitat. And we've spent a lot of time defining wilderness or defining um, natural environments and trying to protect, restore, and figure out what is the perfect balance. But I don't think we've spent enough time figuring out human habitat and defining that. And I think there's biophilia aspects to that, as well as biomimicry aspects in, in designing with nature. And so I think if we defined human habitat, I think we'd have a new appreciation for society and our relationships with each other and our relationships with the natural world. And I think today it's being done on a building by building level. It's done on a, on a town or a city by level, depending on the political climate, depending on um, the, the forces at play, whatever projects are going on at any one point of time, um, where the funding is and, and how it's coming about, coming together. And so I think a collective view of defining human habitat would help us better understand how to not be a destructive species, but a productive species, productive in a way where it's mutually beneficial to people and nature. OK, one last question over here. Thanks. Um, I work for a group called Zero Waste Washington. We're a small nonprofit group. And so my question is, um, what are you seeing in the arena of product design that's designing um, products for reuse and recycling and cradle to cradle instead of designing them for the dump. And um, kind of as a piece of that, how, how would you, um, or, or what, how do you see us um, finding a pathway to encourage the manufacturers to actually move in that direction? Um, well, currently, we're working on a program within Living Building Challenge that takes, we have a requirement within Living Building Challenge called the Red List, and uh, it lists sort of the um, known endocrine disruptors, carcinogens, and such uh, that 
you know, need to be excluded from a building in order to comply with Living Building Challenge. And um, we're actually going to be shortly launching a program where we're asking manufacturers to sign up and, and just reveal and be transparent about their ingredients, which I think is uh, one of the first steps. I think one of the challenges with materials is that we don't really know what's in them. Um, so therefore, they end up in the dump because we don't really know all the many components within them, how to recycle or, or how to transform them. And sometimes we do know, but we put them in the dump anyway. But <laughs> I think one of the one of the first steps is to is to develop a language around transparency in, in our products. And um, you know what we're finding is our living building challenge teams are going out and asking questions of manufacturers: What is in this product? What are the ingredients? Is that often the people selling the product don't know, the um, manufacturer's representatives don't know, um, even up to the CEO doesn't know <laughs> really what's in their product. And so it's starting a dialogue where um, you know, they're needing to tell us what the ingredients are. And I actually think that's one of the major steps, which is you know, if you know there's something in here that's, that's harmful to people, we know that we can't. We, we can't do anything with this product once it's made. At the end of its life, uh, there's no way that um, without causing more harm to human health, we can, we can even recycle this product. Um, and so I, I do think that's one of the first steps. And we are seeing more and more products that are starting to declare and being willing to reveal what their ingredients are. And we're also seeing manufacturers that are alarmed because they didn't realize some of the stuff was in their products. and they're, they're actually getting excited about trying to find more natural, um, biomimicry-inspired, if you like, solutions um, and alternatives in their product. Um, so I see that as a wave, the next wave of, of products um, happening right now. And I think it's actually going to change pretty rapidly. OK. Well, I think that's a great question to end on. I'd, I'd like to thank both of our speakers. This was a tremendously insightful and very interesting conversation. and. Uh, I really appreciate both of you taking the time uh, to be a part of this. So uh, thank you guys very much. Thanks for joining us. I'd also like to thank all of you for being here, for providing such and such intriguing questions and wonderful ways to keep the conversation going. So give yourselves a hand. I think that you're a big part of what makes this successful. And I also want to thank our sponsors, and hopefully we'll get the get the uh, uh, the uh, PowerPoint showing them again. So make sure I mention them all. But particularly Muckleshoot uh, Tribe and uh, uh, ZMG ZJF. I keep wanting to go ZOMG because that's <laughs> the the internet uh, uh, meme. But uh, I want to thank both of them for their sponsorship. We wouldn't have been able to put on uh, quite as nice an event without their help. So if you could give those them a hand. And then finally, we're going to have, for the next 15, 20 minutes, maybe we have to be out of here by 9, we're going to have these little breakout groups where Nicole will be over here, and we can pull chairs around, and you can ask her questions directly and have a uh, much more intimate conversation with her. Uh, Amanda will be over here. Uh, we'll try to have these facilitated so that there's a good conversation. Everybody uh, gets a chance. You don't have to stay if you want to leave, but we really encourage you to uh, be a part of these conversations that are tend to be a little more in-depth uh, uh, in and uh, intimate than being up here on stage. Uh, thank you all. Have a, a nice drive home, or a walk home, or a bus ride home, or a bike ride home, or whatever biomimic approach you have to getting back to your house. <laughs>